So good afternoon, everyone. Your best Italian host ever. It's, uh, it's again here. Uh, we have had all lunch. We all have our refreshments. I see no, okay. Um, we have now Robin from Sipman. Uh, it's Robin Sipman from ING, lead developer. It's, uh, I must say, it's, um, it's beautiful to have, this is our first um, consumer of Kubernetes coming on stage. It's, uh, we always see vendors getting their talks through as not product pitch, it's fantastic. You guys are doing a great job, but it's also nice to see consumers, to see what the troubles that they go through to, to enable Kubernetes within their organization. So Robin, would you like to join me? Yes, thank you very much. Give it up, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Hello. So the mic is working, that's good, and everybody has a full stomach, I hope. So that's nice. I'm gonna talk about ING's container hosting journey. So uh, like you already said, we have our own private cloud, and we're building container hosting there. Uh, and one of the services that we offer on that container hosting is what we call namespace as a service. And this talk is mainly about what does that infrastructure actually look like, uh, and how did we build that journey? So first, a little bit. My name is Robin Siepman. I'm the lead developer in the ING container hosting platform team. That's what that uh, acronym stands for. And ING is, is a bank, uh, but we write a lot of software. We are very apparent in, uh, in Europe, but we are uh, all over the world. Uh, and in fact, the container hosting platform team, the team that I'm in, is also a team that has uh, many nationalities in there. I think that's very cool. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk about why do we actually do namespace as a service as opposed to maybe giving full clusters uh, out in the private cloud. Um, and then what does that stack actually look like uh, in, the, in the private cloud uh, structure? Uh, and then I'm gonna zoom in on uh, how we built the namespace as a service on top of uh, OpenShift. Uh, so I already uh, spoiled it, we run OpenShift uh, instead of Kubernetes, uh, on top of Kubernetes. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the dependencies that we have to, to build this, uh, this journey. And then I'm gonna zoom in to some of the, uh, the controllers that we have, some of the applications. So there's some Python code in there, there's some Golang code in there. So uh, I hope you're excited for that. And of course, uh, uh, a demo. Uh, I recorded it though, so it's not a live one, but it's a demo nonetheless. Uh, so let's dive in. So we only offer namespace as a service. And the goal is, I'm just gonna go through the full slide. <laughs> it's a lot of text, but uh, in ING, we have a full um, cluster, right? And we don't want to give full clusters to consumers because then we give out a lot of nodes, a lot of resources, and they will not be utilized fully. But if we build a multi-tenant cluster and we offer namespace as a service, then we are in full control of the compute and we can give out the resources to namespace of those uh, exactly what they need, right? So if, uh, if one, namespace of one application requires uh, 10 CPU cores and 10 gigs of memory, we give it to them, and another app namespace requires, et cetera, et cetera. But we spread it out over the cluster, but we are in control of, of the compute. And that gives us a number of advantages, also in terms of compliance. The, the people that request a namespace, they don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure, right? The cluster, it works. Uh, they, they don't have to know what compute nodes they are running on, uh, if, if they are patched, stuff like that they offer, or they take the namespace that we give them as a service, and they also uh, get the compliancy on top of that. So they know that the platform they are running on, uh, it has been pen penetration tested, uh, it has all the, the risk controls uh, in place, and so on. Uh, it does mean that these teams, we have a lot of them, we have hundreds of teams that run, uh, that use the same Kubernetes cluster, uh, they are in control of the stuff that they deploy in their namespace. So the compliancy aspect of the cluster, yes, that's in the container hosting team's control, but anything that you uh, deploy on top of that, that's the, the application team needs to maintain that. Um, we will zoom in on that later. If you wanna know more about what it's like to run on the uh, container hosting team, there will be a talk from Adnan tomorrow, and he will uh, give you the journey. Uh, so what use cases do we actually support on our clusters? Uh, we have two main use cases. One of them is 12 factors. I'm wondering here, a show of hands, who here knows what a 12 factor application is? Ah, oh, that's quite a lot, that's good, that's good. For those who don't know, 12 factors, uh, the easiest way I would describe it is that uh, you focus on your app being stateless, 
so that makes it very easy to scale, and if one of your applications gets killed, it doesn't matter, you just spin up a, a new pod. So it's all about portability, scalability, and so on. So it means on the Kubernetes cluster itself, there is no persistent volume claims. There is no persistency at all. Uh, if you need persistency in an, as an application, you connect to an external database. Uh, so external as in, it's not inside the Kubernetes cluster, but still within your own uh, cloud, right? So these are, this is the main type of workload that we offer. Um, for consumers or for data services providers, so these are teams that really know a lot about how to handle persistency, how to handle storage. Uh, for those workloads, we actually offer a storage, which is built uh, on top of port, port works. But they are, for us, they are completely separate clusters. All right. So this namespace is a service offering, what I'm talking about. What does that actually mean? Like, why do, why do you have to build so much stuff for it? You can just do OC, uh, ADM, new project, and, and you're done, right? Well, not really. Because in the fact that if you do OCM new project, then how do you know which users have access to that certain project? You need to give people access to it, right? Or a group, maybe. Uh, you're also going to need some, some networking in there. So maybe this namespace needs its own IP address. Uh, maybe you need your own private network. Uh, and so on. Uh, we, uh, in ING, we have Azure DevOps where we deploy our code uh, to, to on-premise. Uh, but there also needs to be a connection between that on-premise cluster and Azure DevOps. So how, how is that then uh, created? And furthermore, we have multiple data centers uh, in ING. So if one data center goes down, we can move to the other one. But it also means that if you request a namespace in one data center, it needs to be available in the other. Uh, so those are actually a lot of steps that uh, OC ADM new project doesn't do. Uh, yeah, and we have automated that, and that's mostly what this presentation is about. Uh, to do all of that, uh, we have a lot of components. Uh, I've listed them here. One of them is the, the IHHP API that knows all about the different clusters in different data centers, uh, how to orchestrate it. Then we have project controller that ensures that namespaces are on the cluster. And uh, yeah, there's uh, more, there's auth delegator, SADAS controller, image reporter, pod resource meter, and quota autoscaler. Uh, there's a huge list of them. We have about 36 at the moment. Uh, obviously, I can't handle all 36 of them right here. Uh, but I will zoom in on three of them. So I'm going to talk about the IHHP API project controller and the, what is it, the autoscaler there in this presentation. But before I do that, I want to show you what does our infrastructure actually look like. So. Uh, for ING, we have uh, a data center, we have multiple data centers, and then we have a team that offers bare metal as a service. So they make sure that the physical compute nodes that come in, they are registered uh, and ready to be consumed by, by platforms. Um, and then on one side, we have Azure DevOps, uh, well, I should say ING one pipeline, and it, which happens to run in Azure DevOps. And then we have a lot of APIs that we depend upon. So we have seen the B that's for asset registration, we have a charging endpoint, uh, there is some monitoring and logging in there, security monitoring uh, and networking. So these are all APIs that are offered in the ING private cloud. Now that we have our infra code, so everything for us is uh, infra as code, and then we provision nodes via that using an IPI installation running OpenShift uh, 4.10, by the way, and then we get our OpenShift container platform. So this is just, uh, this is an OpenShift installation without any of our own components on top of it yet. Um, then we have all the applications that you just saw. They're also uh, in infra as code via GitOps. We deploy them via Argo CD on the cluster. And then we truly have the ING container hosting platform. And you can also see that uh, these components, they connect to the APIs that are there, right? The, internal infra APIs. Uh, and then finally, we can offer the namespace as a service on top of that. So we have a cloud portal inside ING, very similar to, to what the public clouds have, where you can click like, hey, I want a new namespace, and you go through it, and then actually you call our APIs, and then the consumer has their namespace. Uh, and of course, the consumers, once they have their namespace, they want to deploy their application, uh, so they have their consumer code also in the one pipeline, and that goes into the namespace. Any questions about this slide? Because then otherwise I have to go back. No, that's excellent. Uh, so let me zoom in on some of the applications that we have. The first one I'm gonna handle is called Project Controller. Project Controller is written in Python, um, and it's for namespace configuration management. Uh, when we originally started building this component, uh, we were 
very well versed in Python in the team, but there was no Python operator framework in, for Kubernetes. Uh, so we built our own, which we call uh, Scaffolds. Uh, and I will zoom in on that. And what the project controller actually does is it takes a specification of a project inside ING. So for example, hey, I want a new project with this name and I have, uh, I need these resources, it's bound to this group. And then the project controller, it creates all the resources associated with it. Um, so um, it creates the namespace, it creates resource quotas, it creates role bindings, and so on. But let me zoom in on the Scaffolds framework first. So the way the Scaffolds framework works is you have your own application. So this is if you're building Python code, right? Uh, you have your own application, and then you import the stream watch. The stream watch is offered by the, the Scaffolds package, which listens to a Kubernetes object. So this can be a custom resource that you have defined yourself, or maybe it's uh, conflict maps or whatever you please, right? And then uh, via a watch, the stream watch listens to that, and then it calls event listeners. So event listeners is also a class that the, the Scaffolds framework offers, uh, and that's what you inherit from. So you have a bunch of classes inherit from event listeners. So this might seem a bit abstract, but if I zoom in like this, you can see that you implement a bunch of event listeners. So for example, in, the, in the terms of project controller, an event can be like, hey, uh, I want to create a new namespace. So you have an event listener for a namespace, you have an event listener for a resource quota. Uh, and then when a new specification comes in, so a new custom resource comes in, um, so let's say somebody tries to create an IHHP project, then it goes to the first event listener that says, all right, I need to create a namespace. If that's successful, it moves on to the next one. It needs to create a resource quota. All right, cool, then it moves to the next one, creates, I don't know, role bindings and so on. And the cool thing is that all these uh, event listeners, they are called in order. Um, but if one of them fails, so let's say one of them fails, then the ones that have already been called, they will be rolled back. That's what you see there with, uh, with the rollback. Cool. Another component that we have is called the IHHP API. So the component you just saw, the project controller, it's very cluster specific. It only knows about clusters, but the IHHP API, it knows about different clusters. Um, and that's what you see here. So we have a user, it goes to the workflow, it clicks, hey, I want a new namespace. Then you hit the IHHP API and it calls all those infrastructure APIs that I mentioned before. Uh, and then it calls uh, the cluster API on every cluster, which generates that IHHP project spec and then it's picked up by the project controller and then we have all these resources there. Well, that's a lot of orchestration, a lot of things that need to happen. Uh, and all of it is, of course, uh, time consuming. First, let me take a look. So this is what the API spec actually looks like. So these are the things that we offer. You can get some information about your namespace. You can create one, update it, and delete it. And you can also patch it. For example, if you only want to update your uh, resource specifications, then you can do that. Uh, but in order to go through all these steps, or in order to get the proper namespace. These are the steps that we need to do. So a request comes in, and we first need to get some network information. And that network information needs to be registered in the CMDB. So that's the asset registration part. And then lastly, if that is all complete, then we need to charge for it, and we actually need to create the namespace on the cluster. Now, all of these stages, they happen sequentially. So only after stage one is completed, we move on to stage two, and so on. But all of the units in a stage, so these blocks on the left and right are called units, they are concurrent. So uh, registering stuff in the C and the B, it takes a second or so, right? But we do it all at the same time. Uh, same for that, to speed up the process. But it does mean that if we are in the first stage, uh, we don't want to wait all the way up until stage three to find out that, hey, maybe there is a naming conflict, right? So at the first stage, we already do a check stage, we call it. So we do some sanity checks if the request is likely to succeed. Uh, and only when the request is likely to succeed, then we continue with the run stage, and then we do some actual networking and so on. Um, so yeah. If the flow is all good, but at the last time, you know, like the, at the last unit something fails, uh, then we are in a little bit of trouble because we have executed a lot of actions, right? We have created, uh, we have done the asset registration already and the networking is done, but somehow we cannot create this namespace on the cluster. Uh, in that case, we need to roll back everything that we have done so far. Uh, now, what does that actually look like uh, in code? So all the steps that you saw in, uh, in the diagram, these are, it, it is in code. So 
we have the, the first <laughs> curly bracket that is a, a stage block, so to speak, and you can see the network creation step there, and then we have the other steps that seem to be create, uh, the charging, and the namespace, but they are dry runs in the first stage. And then we have uh, all the other steps, right? I hope this is uh, clean to see. And then finally, we execute everything run the, in the run stage cluster actions and reply call. All right. And the last component I want to show you is called quota autoscaler. So we found that on our clusters, um, or when you request a namespace, the, the requester of the namespace has to fill in how many resources is your application going to consume. And at the moment where you request a namespace, it's very hard to estimate, right? Some people haven't even started writing their application yet, and we are already asking them to give an estimate on how much they are going to use. So that's very tricky. And on, on top of that, then you start building your application, right? And you also need to fill in these uh, pod resource requests. So like how many CPUs uh, are, is your pod going to use? And then again, you're going to make an estimate. And maybe after you've, you've seen it running for a while, then you know what your application actually uses, right? You do your performance test, then you really know what it, uh, what it does. But it turns out that knowing all your resources before you request your namespace, that's really tricky. And to help with that, we have a component called the Quota Autoscaler. So what we do is we look at the namespace resource quota. So a resource quota is uh, basically, you know, I, I hope everybody knows what a resource quota is because we're all Kubernetes. But in case you don't, uh, a resource quota is basically a limitation of the compute resources that your namespace can consume. So the sum of all the pod resources in your namespace, they cannot exceed what it says in your resource quota. Okay. So this is also what you pay for, by the way. Yeah? In, the, in the ING Private Cloud, everybody pays for their resource quota. Uh, now, if we notice that that resource quota is getting full, uh, we can watch that using this IHHP quota scalar component. And when it's almost full, we can automatically do, do calls to our uh, charging endpoint. So to, to, to the IHHP API, we say, hey, this quota is almost full. This team needs more resources. Then we call our automation, and which increases the resource quota. This behavior is managed by a custom resource called a quota scalar object, which looks something like this. Um, I hope it looks really familiar because it's almost the same as a horizontal pod autoscaler. So you have some behavior and you can also set some minimum uh, values and some maximum values. And you have to read the behavior like what is the, what would you like the CPU ratio to be? So if you set down the values 50 and 70, it would mean that I want my resource quota to be between 50 and 70% utilized. If you put down 100%, it means you want a 100% efficient usage of your resource quota. Uh, that means that yeah, there is no space for pods essentially to come up. You're fully using your resource quota. Okay. I want to share some metrics with you with uh, how that affects the resource allocation on a cluster. So. Not too long ago, we were running on Obershift uh, 3.11, and this was what the CPU allocation looked like. So we have over 9,000 cores allocated in resource quotas. Um, these are the actual uh, requests. So this is what the resource quota looked like, what the, the namespaces have, what you pay for. <laughs> and then the request is the sum of all the pods, like what do the pods actually request. And you can see that teams highly overestimate how much resources their application actually need. Uh, and you can see the usage there uh, as well. So you can see that the memory usage in terms of request is quite good. Uh, and for CPU, uh, yeah, there is a lot more burst to it. And now we built another cluster, an OpenShift 4 cluster. Uh, and there we implemented the quota scaler. And you can see the difference, right? So we went from uh, 9,000 cores to give or take, uh, what is it, 2,000 or 1,000? 700 cores, and also for memory. Uh, so we users no longer have to worry about uh, what they fill in for their namespace resource quota. It scales automatically. And one other thing we did is that for dev and test workloads, we saw that there were a lot of high CPU requests on a pod level, uh, and this also allocates the resources on the cluster. But for dev and test namespaces, um, yeah, you don't, they can be a bit more flexible, right? So for dev and tests, we automatically scale down the CPU to 10 millicores, but we still allow users to set their limits as high as you can. So for those who don't know, if you request resources in a pod, you have 
resources request. Requests are resources that you are guaranteed to have, whereas limits, they are reached only if the resources are available on the cluster. And since we have so many compute nodes on the cluster uh, with us, you're almost bound to hit your limits anyway. Um, so this allows us to uh, gain in this margin here. So we have the request for V1, and then for dev and test, we force it lower, and that gives us a nice bump there. Obviously, for memory, we can't do that, because we can't, uh, if you, yeah, memory is not as compressible uh, as CPU. Um, so here are some other metrics. So here you can see the quota scaling, and there you see the, the pot resource mutator that I was talking about. Um, by implementing the quota scaler feature, we save 7.6 thousand CPU cores uh, in namespace resource quotas, and with, with the mutation there for the dev and test namespaces, we save 500 uh, CPU cores in the, in the request. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned this, right? So the pod research mutator for development and test namespaces only forces the pod CPU request to be 10 millicores, uh, but the CPU limits can be capped as it is. All right, last but not least, I have a demo. It will be a very quick demo. <laughs> it is a video, but it shows the full stack as I've just told you in, in the story. So we're gonna requisition a namespace via the IHHP API. After the namespace has been requisitioned, we're gonna scale up some, some workload in it, uh, and then we're gonna see the quota autoscaler uh, in action. All right, here we go. So there we go. Here is a namespace specification uh, for the IHHP area. So it has a name, uh, we have some workload type, we have some resource that we want it to have. Uh, then we post this payload to our automation, right? We create a namespace. So this creates the namespaces on multiple clusters. Uh, we can also see what operations it did. So we can see that uh, there was some networking in there, there was some asset registration, and finally it was uh, created on the cluster. Those are all the steps. Now, if we actually look at what, ha what is on the cluster, so the automation on the cluster, it creates its IHHP project spec. Uh, again, it has the, the same name, it has the same quotas, it has the same workload type, and there's the name. And this is then picked up by the project controller, and it, that creates, in turn, creates the namespace, it creates the resource quota, so you can see that uh, whatever in the specification is reflected in the resource quota there. It also creates role bindings, so the, what groups have access to this namespace, uh, and you automatically get a quota scaler. Now, we have our namespace, let's deploy something in it. So I have this uh, Nginx pod here, uh, it has some CPU uh, requests, it has some CPU limits, so let's uh, make it happen. It's uh, starting up. And we can see we are using some of our quota, right? We're using 250 megabytes out of one gigabyte in our quota. We're using one out of four uh, CPU limit. Uh, so we can scale up to four replicas before we hit our resource quota. So we are completely full right now. If you try to create another pod, it will fail because your resource quota is full. So we have four pods running. And now we scale it up to six. We get all these scary error messages because, well, you're, it's forbidden, right? You're trying to break out of your quota. But this is where the quota autoscaler comes in. It's actually listening to these events, and it knows that you are trying to scale up outside your quota. And it sees here, it calculates based on the specifications of the replica set how much resources it actually you need more. And then it calls our, uh, yeah, our automation, and it updates the resource quota. And we can see it's actually updated there and uh, all the pods are running. So that's what, you mean, that, what I meant with the 100% efficient resource quota usage. Um, yeah? There's more. I have, I have a, one more slide. <laughs> so uh, I showed you a lot of stuff. I showed you some Python code. I showed you some, some other stuff. Um, I mean, it's really nice to boast about it, but it's not very useful for you, unless you can touch it yourself. So can you have all this code? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. So uh, at, at KubeCon, we will open source this live. Um, yes, very cool. And what will you actually get? 
So you will get the code for the code to autoscaler, the full component of the code to autoscaler, you will get it. Uh, for the, the operator, uh, the, the Python operator framework, we will also open source it. You will not get the project controller yet. We are also planning on open sourcing that maybe, uh, but for now you will get the Python operator framework. Uh, and for the, uh, the orchestration, you saw we had all these lines where we have like these stages that we run sequentially and the units all concurrent. Uh, that's what we call orchestration and that will also be open source. Uh, so yeah, that is it. So now you can, <laughs> are there any questions? There are questions, but you guys don't have microphones, so that's. Uh Hi, hello. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I want to ask: Do you use this in production? Because I've seen data from non-production, and I wonder if I, if you already use that. Yeah, we we use everything uh, in production. What you see here. Uh, but the components, they are all replicated across different clusters. So for DTA, there is an instance of the IHHP API quote autoscaler running, and for production, we have another instance running uh, across multiple clusters as well. So yes, everything you see is, is running in prod. Okay. I wonder why the choice of giving the data for non-production instead of production, because the, uh, it will be more impressive maybe to see how much resources you save in production. Yeah, the, the reasoning for this graph is that uh, we noticed for dev and test, a lot of resources are allocated. Um, and for production workloads, we are not very eager to scale down the request. Like we, if a team says, hey, they need that many resources to run in production, we believe them. We don't, we're not going to touch that. But for dev and test, we can be a bit more aggressive. Uh, and yeah, that's why those metrics are a bit more interesting. But uh, for uh, the production metrics, they are perhaps a bit less uh, because you don't have the pod resource mutator, but for the quota out of scaling level, it's still uh, very beneficial. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. Um, I'm uh, working at Aliander, and we have a, super, a, a similar workload. And uh, I wonder well, we made some different decisions, and we used actually used uh, some uh, market solutions like capsule for uh, creating namespaces automatically by uh, the developers uh, themselves. Also the vertical pod autoscaler. Uh, but the last one, yeah, I, it's not working properly for us. So maybe this is uh, convenient to use, but I'm wondering why are you, uh, I mean, why is Angie um, uh, developing these solutions themselves? because there are some solutions in the market. Yeah, so for the namespace as a service part, we have a lot of interfaces inside ING that are very ING specific. Like for example, our, our networking implementation, that's, that, yeah, it is just very ING specific, so we cannot ask a vendor to, to build that for us. Uh, and for the second part of the, the scaling part, so it actually works with the uh, horizontal pod autoscaler as well as vertical <coughs> pod autoscaling. You can use both of it. Uh, and this quote autoscaler kind of runs on top of that. So you can see it as like a, a management for your namespace resource quotas instead. And uh, we talked actually with multiple vendors and multiple companies. Uh, and none of them have built it yet. So uh, therefore we did it. And you can also use it because when it's open source. Uh, I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. Yeah. One question, uh, because uh, I saw that there is a CMDB record yes. against the namespace. So can, uh, with this uh, orchestration, can you get m multiple namespace per C uh, CMDB record, or it's one namespace per CMDB record? Uh, yeah, so what we do is, uh, because we run many, many clusters, and all these clusters, they can have the same namespace, right? So depending on how many times you want it replicated. And what we register in the CMDB is we combine the namespace name with an identifier of the cluster that you have. So let's say your namespace is uh, example, right? And then we will have example one, two, three, depending on like one, two, three being the cluster identifiers. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. 
do you have any uh, restrictions on the upper limit for that quota autoscaler in case of misuse or security incidents? Yes, uh, yes, we do. And uh, I'm sad to say it's also necessary. <laughs> yeah, there is a, there is a limit. Uh, we have, uh, from the top of my head, I think we have like 35 uh, CPU cores and like a 150 gigs of RAM per namespace. Uh, it can be that uh, some of the workloads that we have they actually have an extremely high load, and then they use all these resources, and perhaps they need more. And usually, uh, these are yeah, big consumers. We talk to them about their use case, because if a team hits these limits without talking to us, uh, then usually they are overcommitting the resources that, like, they are requesting more resources than they actually need. So this limit is in place, uh, and then we talk about it on a team-to-team -team basis if they need more. We have a question in the back in the back of the room, Robin. Oh yes. Hey, you did explain about the support for 12-factor applications. I was just curious, does ICHP support stateful applications as well? or? Yeah, so we only currently so. only provide stateful applications for data services. So for uh, most of our consumers, it's all stateless, 12-factor. But for uh, with Insight ING, we have providers that offer data service. For example, the ELK stack. Uh, you might know the ELK stack. Uh, so yeah, these guys I worked in ING for five years, so I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so the yeah, so the Elk stack is a, is a consumer of uh, persistent storage. Yeah. It uses the same uh, automation in in the end. Uh, Robin, are you okay to take one last question? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, I have a small question. Since you're um, basically the like private cloud service provider, um, how many clients do you have at this moment, more or less? Um, so inside the cluster, we have a little over 2,000 namespaces. Um, and I think uh, together with uh, non-prod and prod, we run about, I think it's roughly 5,000 pods. And that's uh, per environment, right? So we replicate everything in another uh, data center as well. What is the metrics you're looking for? Or? I was, because um, I was curious actually about the more technical uh, part of this, which is uh, the persistence of the Kubernetes clusters that you're using under the hood. Basically, uh, did you go with the custom solution regarding the storing of the state, or are you still using the standard one, which is etcd? You were or still using uh, etcd, yes. But for the, so are you referring to the storage we use for our own APIs or the storage we offer for our data services consumers? No, the internal one specifically for the need of the Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, so it's etcd. It's still enough. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th we found at CD. I think it's it's performant, but it's uh, keep a good eye on the metrics, and you may also need to fine tune it. Right? There are quite some nice articles about it, where you can say, okay, I have a huge cluster. What metrics do I need to fiddle with, uh, or what uh, parameters? Yeah. All right. If you have more questions, I'll be walking around still. So, uh, thank you very much for listening, and have a great day. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Um, I am 100% sure that people will come find you, not necessarily for good things. Um, we have uh, now, we're going to restart at 2.30 with uh, Ara, and she's going to show us about um, g the Gateway API. So you can stick around, you can go get some refreshment, but please be on time. We're going to start at 2.30 sharp. Thank you.